Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for High Velocity Radio. Welcome to Coach the Coach, helping business coaches deliver more impact in less time. Broadcasting live on the High Velocity Radio Show and the Business Radio X Network. If you're a business coach and want to help more people make more money and own your backyard, go to brxteam.com. Lee, this is one we've been waiting for, man. We've been in the studio all day. This is the interview we've been waiting for. Please join me in welcoming to the broadcast, author of at least 11 books, the latest one, I believe, called In Great Company, CEO of Best Practice Institute, Mr. Lou Carter. How are you, man? Life is good. It's great to be on with you today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, Lou, before we get too far into things, can you talk about your practice? How are you serving folks? Serving folks, absolutely. Uh, we, we serve folks on a different levels. Uh, the first is we provide them management consulting. So uh, what that means really is uh, we make sure that their projects get done, and we do it with a change management methodology, which I can explain. The other is executive coaching for CEOs. We use something called a stakeholder-centered coaching method. Uh, my mentor, uh, and I'm on uh, the MG100, Marshall Goldsmith's work. And the third is that we run a benchmark research consortium with uh, chief talent and human resources officers of Fortune 500. So we're in the business of helping people achieve their goals and doing it really through a deep dive into what they want to accomplish in life and uh, what goals they need to, to achieve for their businesses. Now, are your businesses tend to be enterprise level or you work with startups, small businesses? What, uh, what's the profile of a business you work with? Yeah, so, so we're, we're focused on mid to large, and uh, we'll still work with smalls, though, as well. Uh, it, I, I have one CEO. I work with a uh, small company, uh, 50 people, and uh, he comes from a big company background, though. So, uh, and uh, that's why I, I work with him individually and in, in his company. So I, I have a small company, but we also have mid-sized large healthcare clinics to TIA, Kraft, and uh, Kimberly Clark. So it, it gets real big or uh, can get small, too. Yeah. Now, when you're working with the firms, are is the board typically calling you in to fix some people or are these individuals that are kind of plateaued or frustrated in their career and they call you? Yeah, what's interesting is I, I, I usually I don't work with people who need to be fixed. <laughs> if that's the case, <laughs> I probably run. <laughs> so what I, what I do is I say, well, if you have a successful person who wants to get better, I'll work with them. And if they're willing to do the work, I'll work with them. If they're not, you probably have to go to another coach. Um, it's not going to be me. Uh, a consulting firm the same way. Uh, if people want and need the change and they want to, and they have need for project management, outsourcing, change management, office creation, and they're in the midst of a change, especially, um, we're the ones for them because they're, they're, they're inside of it. Um, same thing with our CHRO CTOs. If, if uh, you need info, you need, you want to make the changes, come to me. If you want to be fixed, uh, go, go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I'm not the one for you. Now, you say that, but part of your work is in emotional connectedness. Can you talk a little bit about emotional connectedness? Well, connectedness means basically you have to be connected to yourself and others. You have to begin with that core sense that I want to change. And that's what it's about. Like if, I, if I'm broken, I can't help fix others. If others are broken, they can't help fix me. What I can do, though, is I can connect to you and understand the way you collaborate, the way you can respect each other, the way that you uh, enable a positive future. Um, so that we, we, we actually develop a core psychological safety between and among each other that allows us to grow and get better. Now, um, how, tell me about your backstory. How did you get into this side of the business world? Uh, you, you know, it's funny. I, my, my, first, uh, you know, my first job at a, at a uh, school, at a uh, college, was at a uh, consulting firm. I was the only one that wasn't from Harvard there, so right away they wanted to to make me do all their work and they, so that they can go to parties. So I got, I got, uh, my boss told me one day, Hey, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go out to a party and, and uh, with all of your colleagues and you stay here and do everybody else's work. So I left at about 2 AM after the, that, that <laughs> night and the door was locked and the alarm was on and I was without key or code, called him up and he was, uh, too inebriated and, uh, too, uh, into the partying with my colleagues that, 
uh, to really understand what I was saying. So I, I vouch then really to, to, to not work for a boss or company like that again. And that's where I really dove into this field. And I said, I really love this. And I had a great friend that I connected to emotionally, really emotional connectedness, uh, who was into this field of organizational psychology and organizational learning. And he said, Lou, come on over here, write some books for our company. We'll start a publication company inside of our company, which was then called is now also Linkage Incorporated. And I started meeting these awesome people like Warren Bennis, who's passed and he wrote, he was a, a president of college uh, in, in Ohio. And he was, uh, he's a very well known um, uh, author in leadership development and Richard Beckhardt and MIT professor who created change theory in the book Le agent, of, agent of change and I met all these great people senators they can <laughs> showed me to Benzir Bhutto uh, I, I was working with uh, what do we have uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is it's just crazy amount of people as learning and working with and uh, and I got this opportunity to write and learn and read and create and um, it just, I got so in, immersed in it and loved it so much because I just got lucky that I could meet a friend that kind of brought me out of a stupor of this kind of mean management consulting world that I was in uh, to a place of, of really um, being able to express myself, work with great leaders who really cared about others um, and really cared about their, their referent groups, their groups that they served. And um, yeah, and, and the rest is history. Now, what made you transition to having your own firm? That really was I, basically saying I, I had a blessing from my CEO at, at Linkage. I said, I feel, uh, you know, I, I'm feeling good. We started research here. We did, you know, had a great run. I, I want to do this on my own. And because I, I had had really deep, deep conversations with my mentor, Marshall Goldsmith, and he, he really was the reason why. He said, Lou, you, you got to do this on your own. You, you know, you're a great leader here. You're doing well. He, he really helped me become a better leader and as my coach and mentor. And I said, you know what? You're right. I have to have the, the uh, faith and, and, um, uh, and belief in myself to do it on my own. And so I, I went and got my graduate degree at Columbia um, and, and in this field in social organizational psychology and just started it up. I did my own books, my own research, started my started the best practice institute back in 2001 and then so was that a transition for you for um kind of creating your own methodology and your own stamp on things it really was that was the, the first time that i brought together this whole connectedness uh discipline and because i i did um i did four studies on what connectedness is all about inside of companies and uh is to validate this whole principle that when you connect and you feel great about your company, you're, you are three to four times more likely to perform more and better for that company. And I connected it to um, about four different organizational psychology disciplines um, that all validated the fact that it's true. And I looked at thousands of employees throughout the globe and different in different regions. And it's the same all over. It doesn't it's a universal truth. And it's a simple one. So, uh, it, you know, it's sort of like you, you prove the things that are most simple and the, the simplest things are, are the easiest to prove, right? right. So, uh, so it, it made it easy for, for me. And uh, yeah, that, that's where everything was born, really. Um, uh, the, the, I can give you the backstory behind it. Would you like to know how it happened? Sure. So, so um, first day at Columbia, uh, uh, you know, I forgot to put on my alarm clock. So uh, it was, uh, and uh, it was it was actually September 11th. Forgot to put on my alarm clock, and uh, I I was awoken at 9:11 by the the first plane hitting the tower, you know. And uh, so so you know, for first win by us. Uh, I guess I got woken up. I guess, and so uh, uh, so uh, you know, sec the second thing I did was I started a drum circle at Col in Columbia, so that people can really experience what it's like to be in community because spirits for low you know so so take that al-qaeda right so anyway so, so, uh, so anyway so you know i uh that's what happened i brought people together they loved it they were really excited they had a chance to express themselves through drum and talk and also dance and they began really becoming a community and i said to myself wow this stuff's working for people who are not feeling so good about their lives and what had happened and just the dreariness of the experience inside of the city. 
So I went back to the people who I had in my book. And I said, hey, guys, this stuff's working for drum circles and for people feeling really bad. And so I went to Pfizer, this guy at Pfizer. I said, will, will you give me a job as you know, leadership development? And Teddy says, no way. You're too entrepreneurial to be in here. I don't want to work next to you. Just, just said, no way, man. So I said, great, no problem. Well, how about if we do a benchmarking forum instead? And um, we bring all other people together to create the next book, the next research. We answer everybody's questions and become a great community of people who really help transform each other and grow. He said, that sounds good. And so he loved it. He cut me my first check. He invited Volvo, Volvo invited Boston Scientific. BS invited Boston, sorry, BS, Boston Scientific invited Bank of America. Um, and that it just grew. Uh, and Corning came on. I just started growing GSK. And it became a group of friends, really, people who connected on an emotional level, could get work done because they trusted each other. And we had rules and parameters for getting along. <laughs> How cool is that? Have a room of people where you know that they'll always get along and you could feel safe. And then what's interesting to me about that is it it wasn't really your idea. Like you had the you were the catalyst, but the idea kind of grew on its own based on, you know, your intent or hope of working together. And then mm -hmm. you co authored the solution. Um, because if you would have come in there and said, Okay, guess what? You know, hey, let's do a drum circle, they may not have jumped on that, but you were able to frame something that was to their liking that solved the problem they had. So then together you came up with this. I think that's an amazing story. It it, it takes him a few a few glasses of wine to, to get on a drum. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you learned over time? It's a two two glass uh, minimum in order to get a drum circle going. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah but there's a there's a equation to it so absolutely yeah give them what give people what they want meet them where they're at and uh and and, and lead them to 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 where they want to go yeah absolutely so now um from that work then your whole kind of career expanded from that that initial group it did that was the beginning and uh, that group uh, we made more groups and started growing groups and uh got into the pmo cmo business and um then my uh uh, my CEO coaching business with that. So yeah, it, I did. So now a part of your business is consulting where you're actually helping, you're doing some work for them, but the coaching is where you're kind of not doing work for them. You're just kind of nudging and giving them suggestions. Um, how do well, you kind of separate those two? Yeah. So, so um, coaching, I have a process for coaching. It's, it's called stakeholder centered coaching or emotional connectedness coaching. And we, um, everything's based upon what their core stakeholders um, help them achieve. So let's say you had a goal and I, I'll just say it, push it out there, you know, sort of uh, being the greatest radio show on earth. You know, you want to be the king of all media better than Howard Stern, right. you know, all that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, well, I, we would get your core stakeholders together the people that you know will help you achieve that. They may not be your biggest supporters in the world. But they may be people who could give you contrarian information. They'll agree to help you though and, and to achieve your goal. So um, we'll get a group of probably eight to 12 and they have an, uh, they have a uh, arrangement with you to do that. I set them up, get the data first from them, feed it back to you, and then you have conversations with them constantly asking one simple question, what do I do well and how can I get better to achieve the goal that we want to achieve? And that's, that's what the process really is. We rinse repeat uh, every, every month and ask for their feedback in terms of how um, much more effective you are as a leader and how closer you are to your goal. And you do activity-based coaching every day. So you ask, you ask yourself simple questions. What is, to what degree did I do well on dot, dot, dot? Those are the specific things that you know to get better toward your goal of being you know, the, the, the czar of all media, whatever it may be, <laughs> or king of all media. And um, then you rate yourself every day, get better the next day if you did poorly. And then the day after that, you do even better than that. So uh, it's all a process, and there's specific tools around it to enable you to get better and your stakeholders as your team to really um, get, get you across the finish line. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Coach the Coach, helping business coaches 
deliver more impact in less time. If you're a business coach and want to help more people make more money and own your backyard, go to brxteam.com. Lou Stone Payton here with Business Radio X, uh, my favorite part of the program because I get to talk about me a little bit uh, and see if we can't help me uh, be a better coach, <laughs> be a better leader. Yeah. Uh, I'm not out in the marketplace as a coach. I am a little bit of a leader, I would like to think, here in the Business Radio X system. Um, I'm an equity partner in the firm, and I'm largely responsible for the care and feeding of our studio partners, the entrepreneurs in our system who are running studios like the one we're sitting in right now across the country, and we're trying to grow that network. And we are trying, uh, under my tutelage, <laughs> for good or for better or for worse, to build out this collection of best practices, this community of, of people. And um, I have been on the periphery of some organizations that have that collection of thought leadership, that, uh, that knowledge net and that library. And that information has largely in the past for me been collected from people at the very top of their field and sort of this highly revered, almost holy set of materials. Uh, I even spent a, uh, quite a bit of time in the change management world. I can tell you about that sometime offline. In, in what we're trying to build here, I want very much, we want very much for everyone to have the opportunity as we continue to expand to contribute to this body of knowledge, yet we want it to also have plenty of value. So I just, uh, my, my question is this, do you have any counsel to offer um, on how to have this knowledge repository, this collection of best practices, this community of support organized in such a way that everybody can have some pride of authorship um, but yet you're still able to to maintain some quality standards i I'm really wrestling with how to manage the 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 volume and the quality of the content so anyway i'll take all the help I can get if you've got any counsel on that yeah and, and you're asking for advice which is it's feed forward it's a great question you're saying how do I get better at, at uh at managing and creating a best practice knowledge repository so that it's uh, high quality. Right. Is that Yes, sir. And you, you did, you did all that in about nine seconds. It took me two and a half <laughs> minutes, but you got it. Yes. It's good. No, it's, it's good. <laughs> and, and you know, I, what I, what I'd give you for advice, uh, <clears throat> sort of my, my, my feed forward, my advice is um, to, to, um, to really vet who you're, who, who you're bringing on. And uh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, Hey, heck, you, you chose me, I guess. <laughs> so I want to make sure you, you, we get that. I mean, that's good, right? I don't know if it's good <laughs> or bad. And I hope it's good. <laughs> yeah. So like have a set of standards that you know that your audience wants. You you mentioned give people what they want. Remember you, you were saying about, you know, I didn't give them drum side girls. I gave them what they wanted. So I think to get a good understanding from your stakeholders, you know, the, the topics of what they want in advance, kind of survey them and find out what is it they want and what topics they want who do they want to be uh, to hear from uh, what new books do they want to hear from you know like you know I just have a new book out and uh, in great company maybe people want to read about my book right so uh, that's number one uh, check out uh, ask people for what they want survey them a big uh, create your survey make sure your survey is something you can have attainable to create your standards um, and if I if I give you some other advice it's you know it's um it's really about, um, you, you know, choo choose influencers, you know, uh, choose the people who you know will have greatest reach and, you know, people who um, you could connect to as well uh, on an emotional level and a, and a leadership level that, you know, have similar values to you and you can collaborate with and you can sort of, uh, you know, in, in improve each other. Um, it, I have a very simple rule. If my life is better as a result of having you in it, and your life is better as a result of having me in it, then life is good. And that's really the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> now, really how many um, mentors slash uh, advisors do you think the a person should have? That's a great, wow. Um, yeah, so I, I've always had an inner circle of five for me. This is, I can only speak for myself. Um, and I always make sure that there are people that, are, you know, are, a really like a, you know somebody that I can I, I can really learn a lot from. Um, unfortunately, some of the people that have been my mentors have passed. 
Um, so I have to find new ones because <laughs> they were, you know, older people. I kind of, you know, look at them like Maimonides or, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're a little bit older they're in their nineties or hundreds. Um, so, uh, you know, they def- that's what I've always done. Um, you know, they, I, I, a lot of my mentors have been like the Beckhards, the Bennises. Um, Marshall's not too, too old. He, he's a young guy still. I just went surfing with him. <laughs> so you got to think he's, he's young, right? He'll be around uh, for a while. Been, so that's good. He's, he's a little older. He just had a you know, birthday. I, I probably shouldn't say what birthday it is, but if he's surfing at his age, he's pretty darn cool. Right. Um, my best so, uh, you know, it's, um, you know, people like that. So I, I think five is good as long as they're alive and make sure, I think, make sure they're older. To be honest with you. I think they're, you know, because there's life cycles that we go through and, um, you know, we can't, you know, I, I, I can learn a lot of people, I learn a lot from my generation. However, I can learn a huge amount more from people who have lived longer and gone through those experiences and can talk to me from my future self. If I were, and, you know, I have people like that, like Bev K. She's like that to me. Marshall Goldsmith is like that to me. You, you know, um, you know, I, they, they look, they can help me look back at myself. Do you know what I'm, you know what I'm saying by that? And right. say, oh, that's what I need to be thinking about. And they give me vision and not just advice. They give me vision and allow me to see, you know, they give me these glasses that I wouldn't have had gone before. Now I see what's in it for you, but what's in it for them? Yeah. Uh, same thing as the, the, you go back to number one, what we talked about, which is uh, the collaboration, uh, what I give them and what they give me. And uh, it's exposure. We we help each other get um, more uh, get into each other's markets, uh, help each other to which they need something. We're there, uh, you know, whether it's commenting on, on the LinkedIn or promoting and believing and talking about what they have and sharing information and sharing what they know with others. And I just did some of it today. I talked about Marshall stuff. Um, you know, Bev and I did a study on, on uh, most love workplaces. How do you, how are workplaces loved? I'm talking about it right now. I'm giving back to her. I'm paying it forward. And I'll bring that to clients, to coaches, to people, everyone I talk to. I talk about my mentors. That's given back to me. Now, um, in your work with uh, the different companies, do you see some common mistakes that companies are making? With with mentorship programs or just common mistakes companies are making in general? I could do Uh, both. Well, (laughs) well, I'd like to just stay on this mentorship area for a bit. Um, Like in, in that, a lot of people, you know, people are our most important asset and all that stuff. In reality, a lot of firms look at people as um, commodities that they come and go and then they're moving, you know, chess pieces around. How do you develop a culture that encourages mentorship, that encourages being vulnerable and trusting and, and um, getting the full person out of the, out of their employee? Always start with talent acquisition. (laughs) <laughs> that's the first place uh, in the recruitment process and then onboarding, of course, and, and then, then it's meeting and, and transformation management. So what do I mean by those three things? Um, number one, you, you have to screen for people who will be agile enough, agile leaders enough to be able to say, OK, I'm going to go inside of an environment and I'm going to be open to providing the best coaching and mentoring to myself and others so as to create the best possible outcome for myself and others. So <clears throat> that 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 whole uh, foundational approach is continued in onboarding and in, in meetings, team meetings. So you have to find people who are agile, number one. Number two, it has to become part of the fabric of your onboarding and meetings and, and the way everybody communicates. So what I do in the beginning of every meeting is we have agreements that are non-disputable. How can you dispute saying, I will I, I will not uh, withhold information uh, from others that will harm them. I, I will always clear information that are is positive or negative about an individual. Who here disagrees with that? Nobody answered, puts up their hands. Right. So, so you check on that box. Everybody's cool. And then we have dyads where we introduce each other. I respect and understand this individual for how they collaborate, how they respect, how they how they create results. I have a whole five star process, but what matters the most about it is that they're introducing each other and respecting each other. And they're agreeing to certain principles that they will mentor and coach and help each other and the organization toward common goals and objectives. If that's not a foundational aspect of the acquisition and recruitment, as well as the performance management of that individual, chances are they're not the right person for the company. 
and they're not agile enough for the new world. Now, work. but that sounds good. And we're having this discussion. And then in, especially in these larger firms, don't you find that some people, what their superpower is, is being political and good at navigating the politics of an organization rather than maybe being that good mentor and that good person? Yeah, those, those people burn out fast. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, so so uh, there, there is a, there's a CEO that I know and that I've coached who works for a, a, a large organization, a, a billion, billion dollar organization. Like you mentioned, you're an owner of a company, of your company, you're an equity partner. Mm -hmm. So, and that CEO, um, is, it's clear that, that he doesn't understand that he doesn't own the company. He doesn't have any equity interest, okay? He just does politics and work, plays around and he doesn't respect for the board. He doesn't have respect for a lot of people there. Um, he's doing the function of the organization, somewhat some of the goals. However, he, he's using too much politicking. So here's what happened. Uh, the actual owners came to me and said, you know what? He's kind of at a line and he's not, he's not really respecting people. They're hating him. Glassdoor is giving him a really low, low rating. You know, uh, why don't you talk to him? I'll talk to him too, but he needs coaching for this. Because the board's the one that really wants to get better, and they're the owners. They want the company to be awesome. So I said, look, if you're going to continue this, there's two ways out of this, and I want to help you through this process. And he, I said, I need you to hear my voice as well. I said, number one, you can continue being an asshole, or number two, you can get in line with the game. If you choose number one, you'll be kicked out. You choose number two, you'll do quite well. But one thing you should realize is that your title is just a title. It's not really your name. So start realizing you have a job and <laughs> rather than you have, you have a badge to be an asshole. So that was clearly understood by him. And he got it and got in line, became a more emotionally connected, more, more clear with what, how he's doing to respect others. He went to his stakeholders, talked to everybody, apologized to them for what he had done to politic and hurt, hurt people. And that, therefore, his his fall number one will be a lot easier when he when he's going to be fired or he leaves his job because every CEO has a tenure. He didn't realize that. And when you play politics and you hurt people, you have one way. You've only one way out. <laughs> there's only one way out. It's the door. <laughs> so there's only one way to be, and it's real simple. It's good to others. If you live by that rule, you always win. You treat people like a problem. You'll win or you lose. You treat them like a human being. You'll always win. Always. Now, do you find that uh, organizations are practicing that? Are you seeing a trend of more and more organizations truly behaving in the manner you're discussing rather than just giving it lip service? The ones that I have in my book, certainly, uh, in, 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 in great company, I spent uh, years asking and talking to CEOs who were exceptional. Um, Reed Hastings is one of them. Netflix is one of them. Their, their policy, Patagonia, uh, uh, Best Buy. Uh, you know, there, there are outstanding companies who are mindful of this transformation and careful about it. Whether they're in the midst of it or not, um, they're, they're really mindful of this process of getting better, of not politicking, of being human to each other and, and really doing the very best for their customers and each other. Now, what about taking it another step forward to uh, expanding stakeholders outside of shareholders and maybe working into the community and serving, you know, for the greater good? Are you seeing any of that? That's a great thing for anybody to do. Uh, greater good work, uh, you know, and as far as Pat Patagonia definitely is in that, that category. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, um, of uh, environmental work they do. Uh, there's a lot of companies in the UN Global Compact that, that are in that, that category. Um, people typically do sustainability and social responsibility for specific you know, market reasons. And you know, that, that's great, it's not a problem. And we just need to realize that you know, we have, everybody has different referent groups, people, places, you know, people who, who identify with different types of uh, 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 aspects of living. So if, for instance, Patagonia is, is, is about the environment. So you're going to find a lot of work uh, being done with EPA, a lot of work being done with, uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, you know, the environment. Uh, so, so you'll see, you'll see each company has a different reason 
for why they do what they do with volunteer efforts. And if they don't do that, they're they're actually not mindfully uh, volunteering. They're 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 just doing it for volunteer sake. And I say, if you're going to do something, do it for a reason, and put everything you have into it. But are you seeing that as a trend kind of across America in terms of doing, you know, expanding your stakeholders to include, you know, the world, not just or the community or the people that are important to you, not just shareholders or employees or customers? Right. So, so you're saying are, are people generally uh, you know, becoming part of the volunteer well, I want to I want to know if businesses are are really believing that aspect of that their stakeholders are more than their shareholders, their their oh, employees yeah. and their customers. Do they have any responsibility for their community as well? Right. So, so OK, good example is Home Depot. Uh, great example. Um, and these are smart, smart business people, uh, because look at Home, Home Depot or Lowe's or any you know, living uh, retail organization. And I mean by that, there's a reason why Circuit City and Blockbuster are no longer a business. It's not just their, it's not just their strategy of, of, of not moving quick enough. It's because they didn't help the community as well. So I'll say what I mean by that. Home Depot and Lowe's have a new, and Amazon is also doing this, have a way to work with the community. How do they do that? They employ local contractors, local workers to install the hardware and the equipment or the furniture, which makes everybody happy. So there's a there's there's an equanimity an equanimity of the customers and the vendors and the organization and that we're all working toward the same goal. And that's really a beautiful way of, of connecting outcomes is is going beyond just customers and employing and helping everybody who wants to have a hand in it. And uh, before we wrap, Lou, I'd like you to share maybe a piece of actionable advice for that new coach who's just getting into it to help their learning curve. Do you have any advice for that person who's just getting into coaching and uh, that could smooth the way for them? My, my best advice to you is don't focus on the people who don't want to get better. Um, and don't start from a place of deficit. Start from a place of uh, of of abundance. And what I mean by that, it's very real though. F find people who want to get better and who are successful, and agree to it in the beginning, because people don't want to number one admit that they're not doing so well. You're not going to find a client who's who's on there, you know, bawling their eyes out in the beginning. You'll most likely get a, somebody saying, "Hey, look, I am really doing very well, and here's the things I want to do better." That those are the people you want to work with and be careful to choose them properly because these are people you're basically going to be with for about a year or two. And you don't want someone to be in your life who, who uh, uh, isn't a great client, find the right clients. Don't get, you know, don't become, don't get into a miserable situation and get the pay you need because most consultants and coaches out there are making, you know, you know minimum wage. About for in over the year, twenty thirty thousand dollars is the is the um, is is the average for for coaches these days. It's amazing, isn't it? Life and life and coach. It's what? shocking. It's way too low. It's way too low. So get more guys, guys and gal people. And Go higher. Get make the you know increase the numbers. Uh, be brave in doing that. Know your worth. And know what value you're providing. Don't Absolutely. undersell that. At hundred percent. I, that's right. <laughs> that's right. The value you're providing <laughs> and make sure you co make sure they co-create that value. That's if right. You don't, if you tell them, <laughs> then they may, may or may not believe it. Like we <laughs> talked about before. <laughs> now, if somebody wanted to learn more, get a hold of all your books um, and work with your firm, uh, what's the coordinates? Check out, you know, you know go on the website, lewiscarter.com and, or go to best practice Institute. Dot org. You can check out everything there. I give it away at lewiscarter.com, all my articles, and you'll find all, all the things I have online there. And my book is at Amazon. All my other books are amazon.com. So you can find me just by Googling Lewis Carter or going to lewiscarter.com. And that's Lewis, L-O-U-I-S, carter.com. Thank you, Lou, so much for sharing your story today. 
You're welcome. It's great talking with you, and it's great to meet you as well. You have a great show. I appreciate that. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. All right. This is Lee Cantor for Stone Payton. We will see you all next time on Coach the Coach Radio.